Of course, the judiciary is a check on the president. But while the courts established their restraint on presidents in the famous case of Marbury versus Madison in 1803, there were many cases that endorsed slavery. Plessy versus Ferguson, that created Jim Crow. The case Worcester versus Georgia was defied by President Andrew Jackson, which led to the Trail of Tears relocation atrocity for the Cherokee Nation and other Native Americans. In our time, we've seen the court aggressively restrain George W. Bush's use of Guantanamo Bay. And in recent weeks, we've seen the current administration take on the courts over an immigration ban, with President Trump using Twitter to lash out at the federal judge who first blocked enforcement of the ban, dismissing the opinion of this, quote, so-called judge. Leon Fresco is former Deputy Assistant Attorney General at the Justice Department, where he was head of the Office of Immigration Litigation under the Obama administration. He says the judiciary has become defensive of its powers for good reason. Over the beginning history of the judiciary, there were many, many more doctrines where the courts would say that there was not judicial reviewability of certain issues, immigration being one of them, foreign policy being another one, and in general large political questions, the courts used to be very careful to say, we don't have authority to review those, those should be handled by the Congress or by the executive. And what you're seeing now is the courts have been far more assertive in saying that if someone comes to the court with a dispute, the court is going to find a way to at least be some sort of check when they think that a policy that's being challenged is too far out of the norm. What would you say has changed that story or added to that story in just the last few weeks? Well, I think that this executive seems to have come to the the conclusion that a lot of other executives come into maybe years into their presidency, and that's not the best way to begin a relationship with the other branches of government, the Congress and the courts, because once you begin at that posture, then all of the general modes of cooperation that one would normally seek to benefit from as the president become strained. In historical terms, has Donald Trump done the FDR, tried to stack the court and go around his frustration with the Supreme Court, and done the kind of uh, up yours to the court that Andrew Jackson did, all in the same first few weeks? Well, we haven't seen that yet in substance. We've seen some rhetoric that has been unusual. And the problem is, in, in terms of making these historical comparisons, we never had anything like Twitter, where a president could immediately make such comments on the different cases that are happening in the judiciary at any given moment. And so, yes, we've had ebb and flows of these moments, like you said, the court packing in the, in the under President Roosevelt and Andrew Jackson, you know, uh, resisting orders of the court. We've had these moments, and it is true that America survives because the checks and balances of power always come back and the institutions always come back to save us. But the courts are to be treated with almost an extreme level of deference and reverence because if we don't do that and we undermine the institutions of an impartial judiciary, that cuts the very fabric of what is required to have a society that is based on the rule of law. And that's the problem with just the general evolution of where we're headed as a country, irrespective of anything that's happening under this administration, is that when you have levels of confidence in any aspect of the society that are all under 20%, be it the media, the Congress, the courts, the presidency, whatever it is, you know, basically there's no trust in any institution. When you've reached that level, then the, the fabric that's holding a rule of law society together becomes ever more tenuous. Leon Fresco, former Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the Justice Department, where he was head of the Office of Immigration Litigation under the 